I was very retiring. In school as well? Yes, and, you know, I was afraid to stand up, and my glasses always slide down. My, my ears used to stick out of my hair. This is what I was like in high school. But look at me now. Hi, I'm Tom Cottle. I'm not an actor. I wish often that I were, but if I were an actor, I think some of the concerns I would have would be, am I getting any roles? Am I getting good parts? Am I making some money? Am I doing good work? I admit, uh, I probably would think a little bit about fame and money, but I think I'd be most preoccupied with this. I would want to make a list of those people, those actors that I really admire, people I admire so darn much that I learn from, and I don't feel jealous of, and I don't feel jealous of their success. And as I say, if I were an actor, I would have on my to-be-admired list, very, very high at the top, one Miss Geraldine Page. I am delighted to meet you. You, you, you must feel my admiration for you. <laughs> Sweet bird of youth, summer and smoke, now Agnes of God, films, Oscar nominations. You are, you are one of our treasured actors, ma'am, and I'm delighted to have you here. Thank you. I'm not embarrassing you. I'm sure, but that nicely embarrassing. Good. Let's talk a little bit about acting right now, if I may. Agnes of God, will it, will it play outside of New York? Will people have a chance to, to well, see you in this? I hope so. But, you know, this play has been seen in a lot of places all over the country. Already? Yes, it was done in a lot of regional theaters. It has had many productions. And one of those productions was done in Louisville, Kentucky. And that's where our present producers saw the play in the first place. And they fell in love with the play and decided it must come to Broadway. Do you get bored ever, Geraldine, with a part and just feel, I'll with go this there? Part? Not with this part. <gasps> this part couldn't possibly bore you. It's but too difficult. <laughs> it's too difficult? Oh, it's very, very difficult. Complex and difficult. Are there nights when you, I'm sure it's been asked again and again, where you just say, I don't want to do it tonight? Oh, yeah, lots of times. If I'm tired and everything, like, oh, no, Mr. Bill, no. And then when, the minute I get out on the stage, say, I'm Mother Miriam Ruth, I have such a good time. I forget to complain about it. Let's take this little break. When we come back, I want you to think about growing up in Missouri and Illinois. <laughs> OK, can we do that? Why not? OK, we'll do that. Back then in a moment with Miss Geraldine Page. We are back, and my guest, Geraldine Page. It starts in Kirksville, Kirksville, Missouri. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Kirksville. Not Us Missourians call it Missouri. Missouri. Yeah. Sorry, Missouri. Yeah. You were born there? Yes. Will you tell me a little bit about your dad and your mom? Oh, well, you see, the reason I was born there Yeah is because that's where osteopathy was sort of invented, discovered by Andrew H. Still. He was from Missouri, and the College of Osteopathy was in Kirksville, Missouri. Now, my father was a foundling. He was found on the doorsteps of the Little Wayfarers Orphanage in Boston. And he was adopted by a couple named Page, who lived in Barrie, Vermont. And next door to the Pages in Vermont was, I forgot their names, but the father of my father's best friend growing up was an osteopath. So my little Leon thought that was terrific. And when he grew up, he went to Kirksville to study in the College of Osteopathy and met my mother, who grew up on a farm near Kirksville with all her five sisters. And so, when my father graduated from the college, he joined the faculty there. He taught neurology and anatomy there. And we lived at 503 something or other street. I remember <laughs> the address. Do you remember a childhood with serious money problems and serious well, economic I, matters I facing? I grew up in a depression. depression. I remember that. 
It was so precious to me, the dime I was given once a week to go to the movies on Saturday afternoon. And I remember vividly, one Saturday, the dime slipped out of my hands and rolled down the grate in the street. <laughs> it was gone forever, and I sat on the curb and wept copiously for the wrong time. I was so horrified that I had to go home and, and confess that I'd lost a dime. And I never forget, my mother said, that's all right, here's another time. I thought there was the most uh, bountiful action in the world. Was there a time, Geraldine, do I re remember reading this or someone talking about it, that your father, in fact, was earning money, uh, really doing physical labor? Oh, during the Depression, yes. Yeah. I remember that he was uh, helping build tennis courts. It's so funny that <laughs> in the Depression, what do they build? Dennis Gordon. <laughs> so hysterical. But anyway, he did. He was working for the WPA. Yeah. And I thought it was so funny because the shovels and the things that he had were in the closet. I opened the closet one day. My mother, I suppose because she grew up on a farm, it's terribly aristocratic in her views of things. She, was, uh, she didn't want me to see. They, Why not? They, uh, it, it was a disgrace. That he was doing physical labor? Yes. Isn't that awful? Isn't that pitiful? What, what, that they weren't proud of it or anything? Isn't that funny? Both of them were not proud of it. No, I think it was my mother. But on the other hand, if he, uh, I guess he, uh, there was something about, since he's a doctor, that's what he should be doing or something. I think that's, do you think that still people don't, do some people still have those kind of funny, of all the people in the world to have those kind of values, if, he, if you sat and talked to him about it, he wouldn't have talked that way. But then on the other hand, you see, he, div he voted Republican all his life. I said, he says, I forget who it was I was voting for. He thought it was terribly radical because they were a Democrat. But I said, but he says, where did you? But that was when he was a lot older, you know, and lived in Arizona. But anyway, he says, how could you do that? I said, because I listened to you all my life. Would you tell me and read me all these things for? You know, it's funny kind of dichotomies in people's minds. What 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 was little Geraldine Page like? Was she? What kind of a girl were you? How would you describe well, yourself? Well, my in first days? five years yeah. in Kirksville, I was evidently a very vivacious little show off and just as adorable as could be, you know, and perfectly uninhibited and entertaining everybody all the time. And then, of course, when everything got all discombobulated, and we moved around and everything, and my brother was born, so I got jealous, I sort of got very shy. Were you jealous when your brother was born? I think my eyes turned green. They were blue before, I think. <laughs> Isn't that something? But <laughs> you know, when I see one of my own children, it's true that... You were jealous. Yeah. Having had everybody's attention, and then it was divided. And then what happened to you? You became quiet? Yes, I was very shy. I still have to work very hard on my voice to get any, you know, resonance. Because I used to talk. But now I'm a little better, and I talk like this. I've improved to this point, and now, on stage, I can really get some. I was very retiring. In school as well? Yes, and, you know, I was afraid to stand up, and my glasses always slide down. My, my ears used to stick out of my hair. This is what I was like in high school. But look at me now. <laughs> Let's take a break. Okay. <laughs> Back in a moment with Geraldine Page. Welcome back. Tom Cottle speaking with Geraldine Page. Why were you shy? What, what happened to make you shy? I, I've remarked often with people here that 80% of this country, 80% remark that the most frightening experience in their life is to stand up and give a talk in front of people. Oh, yeah. Philip Zimbardo's research, shyness is, haunts all of us. Why were you shy? What, what were you afraid of, or what, what was it, Joan? Well, I don't know. For instance, when I was uh, at, we finally, we moved every 
spring to a different house for the first meeting new people all the time that's yeah but no but but by the time we, we were in on Woodlawn Avenue. So the last three years, from the fifth grade to the eighth grade, went to that, high, uh, that grammar school. I remember that the kids teased me in those days. See, now it's very fashionable to be skinny. But in those days, there wasn't. There was all those ads for Ovaltine for people to get robust you know, and Zoftic or whatever. Zoftic. Yeah. I think they used that word on the can of Ovaltine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, they said the kids used to chant at me and you're so skinny why don't you eat a stick of butter isn't that strange did you find yourself and I remember one, you, another time it's just absolutely traumatizing experience was mother made me go to Sunday school and she also got for me a red taffeta dress that made noise. The taffeta made noise. And I was so, the brightness of the color made me self-conscious. And the noise that it made made me self-conscious. And not only that, she made me wear it to go to Sunday school. And I thought, it's too wicked to wear red. <laughs> Can you imagine, kind of puritanical. Could you tell her I don't want to wear it? Could you say something? Mm. You're looking at me as if you wouldn't no, say that to your no. mother? It w wouldn't got me very far. She's a pretty strong-minded lady. She's stern? Yeah. Stern and kind of sarcastic and, you know. How would she talk to you, Geraldine? How would she say? Well, she had a kind of a whine. <laughs> I used to wonder. I played um, Amanda in the Glass Menagerie uh -huh. one time in stock. And I, I was at such a loss because I had ushered at Civic Theater when Laurette Taylor did it. And I was so uh, awestruck by her performance. I didn't know what to do with it. And that's the only clue I, I did. My memory of my mother's voice because the situation is similar because my mother had... Do it. So much to cope with that I, I found out later. I realized it later through working on that. But at the time, I couldn't see the why, you know. I just how knew she, that it was something. Like, how would she sound? How would she say it Well, to there's you a line from, uh, from the Glass Menagerie. It's a, Laura, are you going to get up, get dressed, and go to the store, or do I have to get up and do it myself? I mean, it's very un horrifying kind of sad thing, you know, that coming from having all your hopes disappointed and not being able to cope and having too much to do and all that. Was that your mother's life, Geraldine? Yeah. You say you worked it through later. I mean, are you implying that you we went into therapy or something? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. What was she going through that she never knew about, that she was struggling with or... Had difficulty well, coping the, with. the part of being, they were also full of, you know, beans and hope and everything when they were Young. starting out. And it was all and, to the sky. And, and, all, and, when, uh, and then when, uh, when everything sort of fell apart, and go to do it, then my father started to drink, and then and she always was so proud of being the doctor's wife and what have you. Your father started that. to drink? Oh, yes. Terribly for years and years and years and years. And he was so wonderful that I just really killed me when this other person, because it seemed like a different person when he, when he was drunk. And then my mother would say, all right, dinner's ready call up and tell him dinner's ready. She would have me get on the phone to call the tavern to say, Daddy, will you come home? Dinner's ready. <laughs> sort of thing. Because he used to love to go. Since he didn't have his classes anymore, he would go to the tavern. And everybody adored him. And all of his taverns that he visited. And they, he just had such wit and humor, you know. 
And he would hold forth, and he'd have people being entertained by him in all his puns and things that he did. And what was the scene when he came home? Oh, martyrdom by mother, you know, and everything, and embarrassment by us. Charming, right? Painful. Painful. Charming, not at all. But it's funny, the amount of, uh, if you kind of sort of measure it all out, now, I very seldom, part of it's blocking it, I presume, but what's the point? I, I don't remember that. What I remember is the hours we spent reading, the hours we spent listening to music. You know, we had one of those... Uh, it's hard to bring up those moments of well, a father I suppose it there. is, except that nobody's asked me this. In centuries, and here I am telling you all these things. And plus, how many people are watching all this? 200 million? Yes. <laughs> no, but you know, Geraldine, I mean, it is a, it is a part of your life, central, oh, yes. not necessarily... Not only, yeah. not only that, it is a very formative part of my life. And I remember thinking that when, when I finally was being interviewed and things, my mother, again, said, why did you tell people that you had to work? She says, what, you wanted to work. We could have given you the money. I said, would you really rather have people read that I was lying around on a beach somewhere all those years and doing nothing? I said, I never understood why she thought it was so terrible. She was carrying on the dream, obviously, of what it should have been, what it portended yes. to be. And you know that just before she died, some publicity thing, they had me posing in Vogue magazine in a mink coat. And she had taken that out of the magazine and it was pinned up on the, you know, they have those little screens in front of the bed in the hospital. She so was she dying in the it. hospital? Yes. And she had this picture of me in the, in the mink coat and it made her so happy. Have you in your life faced the issue of looks, how you look, oh, how you appear? constantly. Living up to other people's standards of oh, how yes. a Somebody, woman should The last look. time I was on TV, a lady wrote me a, a thing and said I look like the Witch of Endor and I should comb my hair and that my hair comb was wrong and all that. All through my life, people have disagreed with me about how I should look. and partly because of what my father read to me about the eccentric types who were wonderful and I admire. It hasn't disturbed me too much. Are you an eccentric type? Well, everybody whatever, tells, whatever tells me means. so. Sure and for a means. while, you know how people, when they write reviews and things, they get a little phrase and they attach it to the person, like Tennessee, they decided he was decadent, and then everything, no matter who was writing, he just you know, went to the corner. It's a decadent Tennessee when you're decadent Tennessee. There was a whole list of things, and they always said, eccentric Geraldine Page. So I just brainwashed, so I used the word. But every di everybody disagrees, and I don't care. Thank goodness, since the 60s, bless the 60s in a lot of ways, since the 60s, people can dress. And look. Oh, and look. Any way under the sun. It's amazing, the variety of ways. It used to be they wouldn't let you in here if you didn't look a certain way, and they wouldn't let you do it in there a certain way. But then they found out that the most wealthy people in the world were these awful rock pe personages who looked horrible. They had to let them in because they were spending all the money. I guess that's why. I don't know what it is. But I like the way I look. I, like, I think I'm very fortunate. I like the way you I, are. I relaxed. I look a lot better since I relaxed and stopped trying to look like people wanted me to look like. I think I look a lot better since I stopped trying. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? Oh, we care. Yeah. A, a brief pause. Oh. I'll be back with you. In a moment, I'll continue this conversation with Geraldine Page, so don't go away. 
Welcome back. My guest today, Geraldine Page. Talk to me a little bit in these last few moments about Geraldine Page, mother. I love being a mother. I was afraid to be a mother, though. <clears throat> if I hadn't all, had all those years of therapy, I probably would have missed the whole boat. Really? Because I was afraid. Afraid of what? Well, you see, I had such a conflict with my mother that I didn't want to be a mother. I thought, those are people that people don't like. I didn't <laughs> want to be one of those stern ones that says, clean up your room, wash the dishes, comb your hair. I didn't, I didn't want to be a sergeant. You didn't like your mother? We, unfortunately, we got along very little. We had a good time shopping. She had a wonderful sense of being able to find things to wear that were very inexpensive but looked wonderful. And we had good times. That, but most of the time, it was a great conflict. I'm delighted to have had a chance to meet with you, oh, and I really look you. forward to another time. But thank you, as always, for joining me, and in this case, with Geraldine Page. I'll see you the next time. Promotional consideration has been paid for by the following. The Tom Cottle Show was recorded in the Governor's Suite at the New York Statler, a Dunphy Hotel in New York City. For reservations at any of the fine Dunphy hotels, call toll-free 1-800-228-2121. Samsonite's Trendsetters Elite, bar and counter stools with wraparound back of imported handwoven natural wicker, contoured for extra comfort. Trendsetters Elite by Samsonite Furniture. A three-door frost-free refrigerator with giant 21 cubic foot capacity. A seven-day meat keeper and separate top freezer compartment for often used items. From White Westinghouse, one of the white consolidated industries. A lovely Broyhill dining room, designed with simulated wood pegging and embossed decals, highlighted by the rich pine finish. Broyhill, at home all over the world.